have some work, I have something to share with you. And so let us share screen. Okay, welcome again to Faith Power Night. And uh, tonight we want to talk about the power of agreement. Now, this is very important in the church because without agreement, we cannot follow the direction of the Lord and of the Holy Spirit. And so the verse that we are interested in is Matthew 18, verse 19. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. The fact is that God has given us power and authority and also wisdom. Wisdom to discern and wisdom is the ability to distinguish what is right and what is wrong to distinguish between, you know, black and white. And so the wisdom is a spiritual discernment that God gives to us. And therefore, when two believers come together to agree on something and they begin to present all this to heaven, then heaven would respond. All right. So this is the power of believers coming together in one heart and one mind. And so the power of agreement begins with God because Jesus, when he came, uh, that he came as fully man. All right. So he, he was fully God and fully man. And, but then this man, all right, this man, Jesus, he said something. He said, I and my father, we are one, which means that he's not talking about, say, we are sharing one spirit, but rather that we share one agreement. We share one idea, we share one concept, we share one motivation, we share one vision, and we share one goal. And so this is called the power of agreement. And so the Bible continues to say that two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. And this is very true because we find that when we have a partner, and then the partner would always be contributing to the partnership. If either one of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And so here you find is talking about, uh, you know, when we journey in this life, there are bound to be time that we might slip and fall, whether it is uh, spiritually or physically, that we need one another. And so in this picture here, you find that this soldier actually carried his injured uh, friend, all right, uh, away from danger. And so this is what uh, the Bible advocates us, is that we are not to live alone, but that we are to live with a community, and so that we will have, we will be able to safeguard each other. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And you see this little cute picture here, whereby the kitten and the dog, you know, and that the kitten is using the ear of the dog to uh, keep herself warm. And so it's talking about us human beings too, is that when we are together, we are not just talking about the physical warm, but we are talking about spiritually. The often time that we become cold spiritually, and we need one another to keep warm. And so the power of agreement has this very powerful idea here. It says one can chase a thousand, two can chase 10,000. And we know this and we have been repeating this, but this is of great importance because we must understand that this is the principle of the Lord. So God's mathematics is very, very unique. Like, for example, for us, is that one would chase a thousand and two should chase two thousand. But God multiply it by tenfold. Is that any time that you come within that spirit of unity and spirit of whereby you cooperate, you find that, that your powerful, I mean, your power and your effectiveness would increase like tenfold. Okay. And so this is the economy of God, and this is how God has planned. And that's why you find a husband and wife, when they come together, they can raise a family and they can create impact in the community. 
Okay, so individually you find that you can do something, but you are in the region of a thousand. So what the devil loves to do is to limit the power of agreement. So the devil would divide and conquer. So the devil would keep us divided so that we will only move in the arena of the 1,000 and not of the 10,000. If let's say two of us were to unite, we can fight 10,000. Imagine many of us who are here, we unite together, we can fight many thousands of the enemy. And so this is what the devil is always seeking to do, is to divide the church, divide the family. Now, if you are having big quarrels with your spouse and then your family is not united, then you know that the devil is hard at work. And sometimes you find that some of the quarrels can be stirred up by the, you know, the smallest thing. And it can be just like a tissue paper or something. And that was what happened in my household before a long time ago. And Pastor Grace and I had a quarrel because of a, a sheet of tissue paper. Yes, and it's amazing how the whole thing would just go out of hand because the enemy is working over time. So in this Sun Tzu Bing Fa, right, the, the art of war by Sun Tzu, and you find that there is a uh, technique that is being used, it's called divide and conquer, is to trick the enemy into dividing his forces. So to pretend that there will be two battle fronts. And so the enemy got to divide the forces to fight the two fronts. But one front would be a fake one. All right, there wouldn't be any soldiers there. There might be a lot of flags and a lot of drum beating and all that. And then the soldiers would be, uh, maybe few soldiers would be uh, riding on horses. And behind the horse, they would be towing some branches and causing a lot of like sandstorm, you know, and, and a lot of smoke screen. And so to cause the enemy to think that the attack is coming from that area. And so that he would dispatch a troop there. And therefore, you see what happened is that then he will have this isolated unit. And so what you would do is put in the intense force and then you can defeat the isolated enemy very easily. And this is how the devil is working over time, all right? It caused departments to be upset with uh, you know, each other, departmental hate be upset with each other, cell groups, you know, leaders upset with each other, pastors of churches upset with each other, and so on and so forth. And for the slightest thing, right? And so then you know that you know that the, the devil knows your, your strength. And that's why he will come and attack that. Then he will use this divide and conquer. So what I'd like you to what I'd like to share this evening is to help you to find companions of agreement. Now, not everybody is a companion of agreement. There are some people who are being sent by the devil to hurt you. And then if God wants to bless you, he also sent a person to bless you. But you need the wisdom of God to discern and to find out who are your companions of agreement. You must qualify people to become your companions of agreement. You cannot just take everybody as companions of agreement. Not everybody is, all right? So you must find, and especially when you have a task to do or that there is a divine assignment that God has asked you to do, then you need to find the qualified companions of agreement. Because when you get somebody who is not qualified, that somebody will disrupt the flow, that somebody may create problem, that somebody may create disunity, and the whole unit will slow down and the task won't be done. So the kingdom of God is being affected because we are not discerning enough to get the right people. Therefore, be very careful, whatever project, whatever assignment, make sure you find companions of agreement. And then you find the right people, select the right people to share your deep relational moments, conversation or knowledge. There are some people you can share just basic knowledge, basic information, but there are some people who are closer to you and you can share deeper things. And these people can be trusted 
with your emotion, with your feeling. And so that you'll find that these are people who come to you like counselors. They come to you like advisors from heaven, all right? And they will give you very wise advice. And so you see that God sent people a favor, not just to bless us financially, but also to grant unto us favor of wisdom. So make sure that you find who are the right people to have these deep relational moments, deep relational conversation and knowledge. You don't just brag it out and share it out with anybody else, all right? And then you share out with the wrong people, the wrong people will destroy you. So people of wrong agreement. To be closely related with one wrong person can destroy your passion forever. I've known of a brother who is very loving, very kind, but he associated with a scammer, all right, somebody who would scam. And then, but he treated this person, so-called he called brother, you know, with the fullness of love. But that guy was, was like a wolf in sheep's skin. And so that wrong agreement, all right, that person of wrong agreement cost him hundreds of thousands of ringgit because he was scammed, all right? So sometimes it's not that, you are sincere and then God is going to guide you because there are two things that you must understand here. One is the person of Christ means that you can relate with Christ, all right, and he will guide you, but then he also gives you principles. So the principle of Christ, the person of Christ is one thing, the principle of Christ is another thing, and the principle of Christ helps us to survive on this earth. Therefore, he says to us to be, you know, as wise as a serpent, but be as gentle as a dove. So it's important for us not just to include everybody into our circle, you know, and everybody we say brother, brother, sister, sister. Not true. Some of them are not brothers. And so you've got to be wise. And not because, oh, you know, pastor, I'm very magnanimous. I accept everybody. No, that is not wise. That is like you eat all kinds of food, you know. I eat everything. I eat sabun. I eat whatever, you know, soap, shampoo. I eat everything because I love to eat everything. That is not the case. You've got to be wise. What would be edible and what wouldn't be edible? Same, what would be person of agreement and what would be person of wrong agreement? You must have the wisdom. And so choose wisely. The Bible says he who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companions of fool will be destroyed. Now, you know that when you walk with the wise people, these are people who love the Lord. These are people who guide you to be closer with the Lord. But when you mix with fools, you know why you'll be destroyed. You'll be torn away from the bosom of Jesus. You'll be torn away from the embrace of Christ. And then you'll be thrown to the devil. And then you'll be, eat, you'll be eating food of the swines, you know, and all those bad things will happen in your life. And you wonder why. It's because you have associated with the wrong people. Therefore, choose wisely who are your people. Choose wisely also what uh, which church you go to. Recently, I talked to a sister and she told me that for 30 over years, she was in this cultic church. And this cultic church, and she was like devastated because she found out that the pastors was using them and every property was in his name and all their donation, all in his name. And so now he owned a farm and he he's making everybody, you know, church members to become like slaves to work in the farm. And if you don't work there, then he said that you are disobedient to the holy calling of God and so on and so forth. So all these, all these are the part of the end time, using the name of the Lord in vain. So a wrong relationship will weaken your passion for the assignment that God has given you. You find that people who, who are called of God, right, that you will always come under attack. And sometimes this attack will cause you to have a lot of disappointment, a lot of discouragement. And then there will be a group of people who will encourage you to leave the ministry or leave the church or ask you not to serve in the church anymore. Okay, because uh, then they give you this impression that the church is exploiting you and all that. But you know the truth that you are serving the Lord that like me, all right, the church is not exploiting me, but that I'm here you know, because of the call of God, okay? Because, of course, I can retire and I can do many other things and go back to my paintings and so on. But then I realized that 
uh, for this remaining part of my life, I'm going to be serving in the church. So, but if I have listened to the wrong voice, then the, the voice will weaken my uh, passion for the assignment of God in my life. Recently, I have this a bit of the low grade kind of uh, depression, I'm feeling a little bit down, but then I kept on with the word of God. I kept with the devotion every day and received the word. And, and I praise God for those words that just come and bathe and, you know, like purify and take away all the weariness and take away all the hurts and take away all the pain. And so God is doing tremendous work is that I have to throw myself, you know, into him. I, mean, I just throw myself into the bosom of Christ, into the embrace of Christ and let him hug me, let him heal me and let him give me strength. And this is exactly what all of us must do because you're out there and you're being buffered by the world. And then you get into wrong relationship. Then you get into the drinking buddy. And then instead of coming to church, you, are, you end up in pubs. And then you are spending time in nightclubs and so on and so forth. And got into the wrong relationship with some women from nightclubs. And so all these things can happen to Christian, yes, because of wrong relationship. So watch who is influencing you, right? Because let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. So that's the, that's the ammunition of the world. The world is telling you, just enjoy your life for tomorrow we life, die. Because why? Because for them, life is just here. There's no eternal life. <laughs> but Paul the Apostle said, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. So here is that watch who is influencing you. Now, if you go into a group of people and you cannot influence them for Christ, pull out, pull out, okay? Don't stay because when you stay long, they are going to influence you away from Christ. They're going to influence you with the things of the world and then you'll be spending and wasting your life doing things that will not bring glory to God. So, be very careful, be very careful, right? How do you qualify your companions of agreement? Number one is that, do they like and appreciate what you are doing with your life? Like I mix with people who appreciate Christian faith, who appreciate Christ, who talk to me about Jesus. But when people talk to me about gambling or talk to me about, you know, uh, this scheme, that scheme to earn money and all that, I, I, I don't mix with them. I know we need money and all that, but when I see that person spending like 70% of her time or his time just talking about money, then I cannot mix. Now, Christian can talk about finances, but, but you don't spend 70% of your time or 80% of your time just talking about money. Can you see? So therefore, my, my way of evaluation is like that. Okay? So now what question have they asked that reveal their passion to be your companions of agreement? So I listen to their question. Uh, those people will come to me and say, Pastor, what about this theology? What about this doctrine? What about, about this method? And what about this way to win souls and this way to cast out demons? Oh, you are speaking my lingo. You are speaking, I can spend time with you. I remember when I first came to Malaysia and I met Pastor Elvin Tan. All right, and I stayed at his house. You know, every night we, we talk until what time? 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Because we are talking the same lingo. We're talking about God, talking about winning souls and all that. You see, so when you find people of the same wavelength, then you spend time with them. So this is how you qualify companions. People ask me, you know, Pastor, come, let's go and have coffee. Pastor, let's go and do this. I don't have time for that. All right, because... The few years more of my life, you know, I'm coming to 70 already. And so if, if I live another 10 more years or 20 more years, it's very limited time. So what I have, I have to qualify the companions of agreement. Then what price are they willing to pay to stay in my presence? All right. So you ask yourself, what is the price they're willing to pay to stay in your presence? At my age now, I can uh, mentor them. I can pass on information. I can help them to grow spiritually. But are they willing to listen? But if they are not, and they want to talk about some other things, you know, 
then I don't really have a lot of time. And then what does it take to stop them from investing their life in your divine assignment? So all these are very good questions, the four questions that you want to ask, right? So that you can qualify who can be in your presence, who can spend time with you, because you only have one life. You don't have many lives to spend. Sometimes people come and say, you know, uh, come and visit me because I'm sick. But the person can come to church. The person can go to work, you know, but he wants you to go to his house to command healing for you. And you command healing over the Zoom, he's not happy. You command healing over the phone, he's not happy. And he wants you to travel there. I don't respond to that. I normally would tell the, the patient, come to the church. You come to the church and we will command healing for you. If not, we will command healing over the phone. Because if I have to go and visit you, it's going to be like half day. All right. So a lot of time people don't understand why sometimes we pastors cannot just, you know, add your real and fancy and then you say, come over. No. So as a pastor or as a minister, you also must know how to say no. Now, close relationship should be earned. All right. It's not freely given. It should be earned, which means to say that you see whether the person honor your time. If let's say the person make an appointment with you and he say he's going to be there at 2 p.m., then make sure that he's there at 2 p.m. But when you reach there and you are there earlier than 2 p.m. and he will come in like at 2.30 or 3 o'clock, then you just show simply he has no respect for your time. All right, he has no respect for you also. And so sometimes because Time is life. Therefore, treasure your life and that you only give to people who treasure you. So you find that close relationship, for me, it must be earned. Is that if you need my time, respect me. All right? And if I need your time, I will respect you too. So what you respect, you will attract. So what's the result of the close uh, the companionship? The result is loyalty, all right, honor, and respect. So it, it kind of increases that you become loyal to this friend, right? You then you give this friend honor and you give this friend absolute respect. So Jesus said, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then he said, you are my friends if you do what I command you to do. So for Jesus is that he has instruction from God the Father to bring commandments to us. And therefore, we are the disciple, though he call us as friend, but he's still our Lord and master. And therefore, if we want to be close to him as a companion, then we have to learn how to obey. He never insists that we have to obey, but he gives us an option. And because we love him, Therefore, we want to obey him. And so a genuine friendship is the gift of agreement. So what does a friend do? A friend will see that you are obeying Christ, you are following the way of the Lord, and you are doing things that, that are honest and righteous, and then he will come in full agreement and not in disagreement. There's sometimes people who come in disagreement when you are doing good things, then you find that chances that person may not be of the Lord. And then this kind of friendship is not a burden of demand. It means that I insist that you do this for me and all kinds of strange expectations. If you don't do, it, do, do this for me, then you are not my friends. No, it's not that. You, you see, because those kind of strange demand, it got to be a mutual agreement that we come together to follow Christ. We come together to exercise the principle of Christ. So a genuine friend will remain loyal even in time of crisis, which means that in time when persecution will arrive or whatever bad things might happen, your friend is there. Or you go through a health kind of a crisis, your friend is there. And this friend is always accessible in time of your loneliness, in time of your crisis, in time of your emergency. You see, if friends cannot help you during crisis, 
then those are not your friends. Unless you know he is inconvenient in some ways. But if he is able to help you or she is able to help you, then you find that she has become a companion of agreement. All right. So a friend loved at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Okay, so the Bible tells us that. How do you know a friend? All right, is that he's born for a time of adversity. That is that during a crisis moment, he or she is right there to help you. And also when you come together, there is power, as we said here, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So how do you have the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit and of Christ himself? Is that you come together in prayer. You come together united, calling upon the name of the Lord, and he will be there. Of course, God is everywhere. But then for us who are human beings, we need to sense the presence of the Lord. And so the tangible presence of the Lord can come when together that we pray, together that we call upon the name of the Lord. Like last Sunday, you know, the open worship, they had a wonderful time. I, I went in just as they were closing because I had so many meetings. But inside my heart was longing to go in. I was longing to go in. You know why? Because I discovered the treasure. I discovered that when I wait upon the Lord, Jesus was there. In fact, one, one day I was hugging Jesus. Like, you know, in my mind's eye, I saw he was standing right in front of me and I stretched out my hand. And as though I put my hand around his waist like that, you know, and like embracing my Lord. I know one day when I die, I go to heaven and I will surely embrace him. But at this moment now, my greatest joy is to be able to touch him, to be able to enjoy him. All right. So come together, come together. You know, we, we have it every uh, Sunday at two o'clock and the music is on and you can just walk in. You can come in for five minutes and go off. You can come in for 15 minutes and go off. Nobody is going to question you. You can come in and just stay for two hours. You know, it's up to you because this is called open worship. There's no, uh, you know, program or anybody doing anything except the Holy Spirit moving. And then we are all in the spirit. And then there will be occasion where we will, prophesize and there will be occasion where there will be uh, just sheer worship in tongues and all that. So, so this is a beautiful time that, uh, you know, that we can spend with the Lord. Now, you don't have to come to our church for this. You can do it at home. You can do it with your family. You can do it also in your own church. You can do it in your cell group. And this will be the beautiful where two or three are gathered in his name. There Jesus is in the midst of us. Hallelujah. Now, the wrong people in your life is that bad things happen when wrong people are in your life. And wrong people give birth to sad or bad seasons. And I worked with the drug addicts before, and many of them said that I learned how to take drugs because of my friends, my friends. And I told them that those are not your friends because your true friends will never give you poison. Your true friends will never seek to destroy you. In fact, I learned smoking through my friends. At, at one time in the army camp, you know, I was having cold and I was uh, sneezing and all that. And then there was this guy who came and said that, hey, Kang, you know, smoke this and then you, the cold will go away. And so <laughs> I was so dumb, you know. So I took it and then I got hooked to it. And then <laughs> that was like, uh, until I got safe, yeah. But that, the wrong people will come into your life. So you must have the wisdom to discern. Now, Jonah, <laughs> Jonah was the wrong person in the ship. All right. Now, you know about Jonah. He ran away from God. God said that you go to Nineveh. And then he wanted to run to Spain. You know, he wanted to take a ship to Spain. And then, so he went on to the ship. And then there was this storm and storm and storm. And God was saying, I'm going to shake this guy out of the ship. And so when the sailor realized that, because Jonah himself confessed, I'm the one who caused the storm. I think God was trying to get me out. And so they cry out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life because they are going to throw him into the sea. Do not hold us, us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you please. 
Then they took Jonah and threw him off a board, and the raging sea grew calm. So sometimes when a wrong person enters in your life, he might bring a storm. So watch it. If you have a storm in your family, you have a storm in your office, you have a storm in the church, you might want to find who is that wrong guy, all right? That maybe he is the one who brings that, that storm. But I'm not asking you to go and be uh, superstitious and look at everybody, right? But there is a reason, and then you will find it, and God will show that to you. Now, there are wrong people who sent by the devil who pursue you, okay? Now, anyone who pursue you have an agenda. Whether you are, maybe they want your money, like my friend's case, right? That this, this scammer came after him, was after his money. They might want you, all right? They might want your status, or they might want sex, or they might want all kinds of uh, illicit stuff, all right? So your pursuer has a motive spoken or unspoken. But if you are not wise, then you will accept these people as though they are close to you, okay? And so the, the agenda may be known or unknown. It may be pure or impure. So whatever the motive, you must uncover it at any cost. You must find out why this man is following you or why that woman is coming to you and why is she so nice to you and why is that guy so nice to you. So you've got to find out what is the reason. You've got to find out at any cost because if not, then you find that the law of eventuality will happen. It means that eventually, you know, whatever wrong thing will happen in your life would happen. And so this is what every uh, of the bad things that happen begins with a wrong conversation. It means that you start to communicate with somebody very deeply. So Samson never forgot his introduction to Delilah. Okay. And so sometime later, the Bible says that he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Okay. And what happened? It caused his downfall. So the law of eventuality will determine your life. Now watch it. If the Lord give you, you know, this download and say, be careful, be careful, be careful. But you keep pursuing that path. Then the law of eventually, uh, eventuality will happen, will happen. But when the right people come into your life, it's different. When the right people enter your life, right things begin to happen immediately. So the woman of Samaria, she met this man. Right, but who was this that this man, Jesus at the well? Imagine, all right, that she met Jesus and he changed her, her life, yeah. And so the the briefest uh, encounter in that moment may become the turning point in your life, so much so that you will achieve the greatest dreams you have, you know. Uh, in your lifetime. It means that you carry this dream and you want to do it and you work so hard for 10 years, nothing happened. But when God sent a person of favor, the right person come into your life, then things start to happen. So I was saying that time when my orphanages, they were not having enough finance and funds to run the orphanage. And then God sent this sister, all right? And she went and worked with the United Nations and she put our orphanage name up front and then we got the funding immediately. And so the right people that God sent in your life will change circumstance, will change everything around you. And these are the right people of significance. So your relationship will determine the success of your assignment. Okay. So make sure that you get to the right relationship because your assignment may not come from you, but come from God. So the most valuable person in your life is the one who is feeding your faith. The one who feed your faith, the one who always encourage you to, you know, to have your devotion, to read your Bible, to seek the face of God, to love God and all that. That person, that person is the one who is very valuable. Okay? But you also must be very careful because, of course, the, uh, those uh, wolf in sheepskin also pretend to use the scripture and all that, that ultimately will take something from you. 
and then you will know. But God is going to give you wisdom and discernment. And so now, in conclusion, I want you to look to, at what Paul got to say. He said, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and admonish you. So these are the people of favor, okay? And so these are the people of agreement, right? That they are the one who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you, means that, you know, guide you and instruct you. And you say, hold them in the highest regards in love because of their work. So how do you know who are these uh, people? You look at their fruits, you look at their work, all right? And live in peace with each other. That when you receive such a blessing, you receive such agape love, guess what? The agape love is going to flow out and you are going to live in peace with people around you. Even those people who are not lovable, but you will live in peace with them. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and destructive. There are, you know, in ancient days, there are people who are idle and destructive. They come to eat only, they never serve, you know, and so on and so forth. But he say, warn those, warn them. But then encourage the disheartened and help the weak and be patient with everyone. So our job is to warn, to encourage, to help, and to be patient with everyone. And then finally, he said, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. And so doing good is part of your life. And so when you start to have people of favor helping you, but one day you are going to be the person of favor yourself and that you can enter into agreement with some of the younger people or some of your mentee or some of the proteges that God has uh, sent you or your spiritual sons and daughters. And then what happened is that this agreement you become the person of agreement and you built up their life. Praise be to God. I trust that you will enjoy this uh, little message and that your life will be filled with wisdom so that whatever that you do, you'll bring glory to God. Amen. Praise God. Mm -hmm.